change the verbiage at all. This is what I want you to tell. Don't soft sell it. Don't work your way around it. Don't, you know, circle the airport before you land. You just tell them these words. And Jeremiah did, and he was faithful to the Lord. And for his efforts, <laughs> they wanted to put him to death. They were not at all receptive to the things that the Lord had to say. So now the Lord wants to send another message, and he wants to use Jeremiah again, this time not with a spoken word, but with a visual message. And it shows us that the life of a prophet, while many times being dangerous, also can go to the side of being a little crazy and a little bizarre. And that's what this is. Look at what it says in verse 1 of chapter 27. In the beginning of the reign of King Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord to me, Make yourself bonds and yokes and put them on your neck. So the Lord comes to Jeremiah. He says, I want you to make a yoke bindings and all and i want you to put it around your neck now the idea was is that everywhere that he would walk people would look at him and they would say hey jeremiah why are you wearing that yoke and it created a perfect opportunity for him then to be able to share the message that the lord wanted spoken but not only spoken but he wanted the people's attention to be brought through this symbol a yoke, we know, is a device that's used to bind animals. It goes around their necks, and it binds them in such a way that you can control them for the purposes of putting them to work. The Lord wants the people to know that they are going to be bound to Babylon. They are going to go into bondage, and He wants them to understand in the same way that they would bind an animal, an ox, or some other, that they too are going to be bound. But not just Jeremiah. Look at what it says in verse 3. He says, And send them to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the Amorites, the king of Tyre, the king of Sidon, by the hand of the messengers who come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, king of Judah. Now, this is a time frame that is between the second and the third conquest of Jerusalem. We know that Jerusalem was overtaken three times. The first time Nebuchadnezzar came in, he took most of the, the items. He, he basically laid the, the, the town to the point of, of not waste, but to the point of total control, and then he went away. Well, they started uprising, and so he went back a second time, and the second time he brought even more hardship on the people, and that's when we see him taking the princes, and we see when Daniel, and we see Rakshak and Benny, and those guys, they all wound up going and being brought into Babylon to be, to be reprogrammed, if you will, and indoctrinated to become Babylonians instead of Jews, and then that way they could assist in controlling this unruly crowd of people. Well, during this time, between the second and the third conquest, there was an uprising in Babylon. Actually, there was almost a coup. And it came to the place to where Nebuchadnezzar was finding himself to be somewhat weakened, and Zedekiah, the king of Judah, thinks he would take advantage of this opportunity. Because there's unrest and there's turmoil in Babylon, now's a good time for us to cast off this binding that we have been under. He calls for these other surrounding kings and nations to come together to form a plan. And these other king's managers come, and they would have been the, the emissaries and maybe the, the military men to come and to set a plan in place on how this would all work. And when they got ready to go back to their king, the Lord says to Jeremiah, give them a lovely parting gift to take to their king. Give them a yoke for themselves. I'm not yoking here. Give them a yoke. I want them to have this symbol of bondage, and you need to give it to these messengers so that they can take this and the messenger back or the yoke back to the king now you got to love this picture first off we have to consider god is serious but almost to the point of sarcasm i mean god's got a sense of humor how many of you know that god is really look at us god's got a sense of humor Right? I mean, I mean and, and, and he knows our human condition. And so he wants Jeremiah to take and to present these yokes, this symbol of bondage to these messengers for their kings who have just been sitting around the table planning on how to get out of bondage to Babylon. I can just see Jeremiah going, Lord, really? Really? Th th this, is, this is what you want me to do. 
The last thing you had me do is carry a message, and by virtue of carrying the message and saying exactly what you told me to say, they wanted to kill me. And now you want me to take and give a yoke to these, the most powerful men in my world. These are the most powerful men in, in, in his world at that particular point in time and give them a message of bondage? <laughs> really, Lord? I guess the most that they can do is kill me. And so he does. The Lord says, command them to say to their masters, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, thus you shall say to your masters, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are on the ground, by my great power and my outstretched arm. And I've given it to whom I, it seemed proper to me. So Jeremiah is told to send this message to the king. He says, okay, guys, want, God wants you to know that he made it all, the earth and everything in it, you, me, the animals, everything. He controls everything. Everything you have, king, comes from God. Now, you've got to imagine these kings, as do those kings in our day, have a pretty high opinion of themselves. They have pretty big egos. They, they, they think that somehow or another that it's because of their greatness and their capacities and their, their mental abilities that somehow or another that they are so far superior to other people that a message like this would have been hard for them to tolerate. But yet, he wants them to know that they are only leaders in their kingdoms because he has placed them there. Guys, how I wish that our leaders today would go back to some sort of time and understanding that the only authority that they have comes from God. The only reason that they have been called to serve in the capacities that they have is because God has placed them there and he can raise them up and he can take them down. And that they need to acknowledge that there is an authority in something bigger than they are. How wonderful would it be to know that there's a God in the hearts and minds of those who lead. In verse 6, Now I have given all of these lands into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. There it goes again. Doesn't that just irk you when God calls a pagan god his servant? Now we talked about how the fact that even unwittingly he was. And he's given him the beast of the field, and I've also given him to serve or I've given, yeah, given him to serve him. God says, everything that I have, everything that you have, I've given to Nebuchadnezzar. And there's not anything that you can do to change that. You guys can come together. You can set a plan in place to try to overthrow what's coming through Babylon, but it's not going to work. And guys, when God sets a plan in motion, understand that the best that we can do, the smartest thing that we can do when God is moving in a particular direction is move with Him. Move in the same direction that God is moving. If it says to do something in His Word, then do that in that direction. Don't stand in opposition to it because we're never going to succeed if we come to the place of trying to do that which is opposed to God. Our best efforts are going to come to nothing if it's in opposition to the Word of God. I get a kick out of those that say, well, I don't believe that God, and then you can fill in anything you want. Well, I don't believe that God would send somebody to hell. I don't believe that God would, would, would let somebody get sick and die. I don't believe that, that if God is good, and, they, and they, they have all of these situations to where they've prescribed what they believe about God. And I always want to tell them, you know, it really doesn't matter what you believe if it's not in alignment with what God has said. Now, it's very important that we believe what God has said. So, so what we believe is truly important. But if it doesn't line up, it doesn't mean anything. You can have all of the beliefs that you want. You can have all of these aspects of you not believing God's Word and therefore inserting your own narrative in its place. But the reality is, is that it's going to come to absolutely nothing. And that's what we see happening here. God had told Judah and these other kingdoms that they were going to go into bondage. They didn't want to hear it. I don't believe that. Have you ever heard somebody say that when you say, well, God has said this and I don't believe that. 
it doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't matter if you don't believe. God said it. There used to be bumper stickers years and years ago when I was, when I was growing up and, 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 and new within, within the whole Christian kind of thing where, where people started advertising Christianity and bumper stickers. And one of them said, you know, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. How many of you remember that bumper sticker? Great bumper sticker, right? Except it, it went way too far. It didn't need to say, I believe it. God settled, said it, that settles it. Whether I believe it or not has nothing to do with the fact that God said it and it's settled. It's done. And so in that area in between, when we come to the place of trying to, to disprove or try to influence what God has said based on our belief system, man, we're going to miss every single time. God says, you don't have the power that you think that you have. In the end, you're going to do what I tell you to do. Boy, that's good advice and understanding as believers. In verse 7, so all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the time of his land comes. And then many nations and great kings shall make him serve them. And it shall be that the nation and kingdom which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and which <clears throat> will and which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation I will punish, says the Lord, with the sword, with famine, with pestilence, until I have consumed them by his hand. Therefore, do not listen to your prophets or diviners or your dreamers or soothsayers or your sorcerers who speak to you, saying, You shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. They remove you far from your land. And I will drive you out, and you will perish, but the nations that bring their necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let them remain in their land, says the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell in it. God says, I've given the land and everything in it to Nebuchadnezzar. And it's going to happen until a time that I determine for it to be over. Now keep in mind, God has already determined a period of 70 years. We've seen that. We know that that's what's going to happen. And there's always those that want to try to prove God wrong. And I think it's amazing when people try to do that. And, and there was no exception with this. The king had many advisors and many people that were promoting the fact that Jeremiah was wrong. None of this is going to happen. As a matter of fact, they were telling them that it was all going to be over soon and everything would return to normal. But God says, no, it's not. And if you don't comply with what I've commanded, you're going to lose everything. But if they follow God's direction, he says he would allow them to stay in the land, that he would allow them to stay in the land, that God would allow them to stay. See, he's using Nebuchadnezzar, but Nebuchadnezzar is not the one that's going to allow them to stay. God is going to allow them if they will follow his command. And if not, all would be lost. It's hard for us sometimes, it's very hard for us sometimes, <laughs> to see God moving in the midst of the ungodly in such a way that he's trying to affect some sort of change in his people. But that's exactly what's happening. God is using an ungodly, heathen, pagan king to teach Judah a lesson a lesson for them to understand that the further that they get away from him, the less protection that they have. And he's going to allow them to go into this bondage. He's going to allow them to be in bondage for 70 years in order for them to realize and to recognize that they should have never strayed from God in the first place. And so when I look at our lives and I look at the historical aspect and I look at the, the present circumstances that we're in, I can't help but wonder, are there aspects of this where we see that these, these certain circles that are, that are impacting our lives and doing so in ways that are negative and even in ways that are evil is the intent that God is trying to send us a message? Is God trying to tell us something? Is he trying to wake the church up? Is he trying to tell us that the time is drawing close and we need to be more involved than we ever have been before? I find it really, really hard to get comfortable as a Christian. 
Because about the time that I get comfortable, something happens. And maybe it's just the, 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 the church life thing and the way that it works. But there's always enough stuff going on around here for me and five other people at a minimum, right? There's always permits that take way too long to get. There's always stuff that's coming out of, out of legal issues. And there's always stuff that's coming out of problems with I mean, there's always enough stuff going on. So the idea of ever getting comfortable to me is difficult. I would like to see what comfortable looks like for a week. Yeah. But you know, God wants to work in everything. We're given so many sweet promises of God. In verse 12, the message now goes straight to the king. I also spoke to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words, saying, bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Why will you die? And your people by the sword, by famine, by pestilence, as the Lord has spoken against the nation that will not serve the king of Babylon. Now, you got to remember, this was not a message that would have made Jeremiah real popular. He's talking about giving in to the enemy. He's talking about things that, that, that would call for the nation of Israel to succumb to and just, just roll over and submit to Nebuchadnezzar. This is paramount to treason. This is paramount to him, him being a traitor. He's talking about giving over to the other side. And yet he's speaking for the Lord, and the Lord is saying that unless you do this, you're going to be destroyed. As Jerusalem continues to rebel, not against Nebuchadnezzar, but against God, destruction is sure. And God says, if you stop rebelling, if you would just do what I tell you to do, you can stay in the land. You can, stay, you can still farm your land. You can still live in, in, in Judah. You can still live in Jerusalem. You'll still be able to stay here. If you will submit to the authority that's placed over, you'll be able to stay here. But if you don't, you're going to die. It's said that misery loves what? Company. And it's true. Because when we're in a place of rebelling, it seems like there's always those that will come alongside of us and can encourage us to continue to rebel. Now, now as, as Christians, our, our hope and our desires as we come together for fellowship, as we come together at church, as we come together as, as believers in Bible studies and in, and in times of fellowship, that that aspect of encouragement that is there, and that's supposed to be that, 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 that aspect of, of being encouraged by others that are like-minded in the Lord. But you know as well as I do that if you get away from the Lord, that the encouragers in the other direction show up too. Start walking away from the Lord for just a couple of weeks and watch how many heathens start tracking you down and want to start encouraging you to continue in the direction. And you know how it works. Start hanging around the wrong, wrong, wrong guys at the water cooler and, and, and engaging in, the, in, in the, 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 the shop talk and engaging in all this stuff. That go, and, and watch what happens. All of a sudden, there's so much encouragement to walk on that side of things that it almost becomes overwhelming. It almost becomes something that is beyond our ability to come back. But understand, there is no safety in numbers when those that are numbered are ungodly. There is only safety in the house of the Lord. But the question is, why will you die? And it's a pretty Amazing question. Why will you die? You don't have to die. No one has to suffer an eternal death and separation from God. For those who would, would say, why would God send people to hell? I would say, well, why would they want to go? God doesn't send anybody to hell. People choose to go to hell. Why would you die? Why would you choose death rather than life? Why would you put yourself into a place? And, and, and folks want to somehow or another put this on God, and the reality is, is that we choose to follow or abandon God's will. It's not God's will that makes the choice for us. But God said that He has come for all who so will. Anybody who will can receive eternal life. So He says, therefore, don't listen to the words of the prophets 
who speak to you saying, you shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you, for I have not sent them, says the Lord. Yet the prophecy is a lie in my name, that I may drive you out and that you may perish, you and the prophets who prophesy to you. Also, I spoke to the priests and to all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, Do not listen to the words of your prophets who prophesy to you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house will now shortly be brought back from Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. And do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Why should the city be laid waste? Boy, these, this, is, this is rough. Give in. Give up. Serve Nebuchadnezzar, you'll live, it'll all be good. But the Lord says, whatever you do, don't listen to those that are telling you that it's okay. That it's not going to happen the way that I've said. You see, at the same time that Jeremiah is speaking for God, there's other prophets that are spreading a false narrative. There's a lot of fake news going around Jerusalem. And this is the current status of our world today is there are many, many voices that claim to speak for good or speak for God while giving license to sin. And guys, we've got to be really careful not to get caught in these false narratives. Many of them sound very, very appealing. Many of them kind of sound warm and fuzzy in what is right and what we should be doing. And boy, wouldn't it be better if we did this? And guys, remember... We have to stay with what God's Word has said, not what we choose to believe. We need to stay away from those that would condone social behaviors and choices that are clearly against the Word of God. We do so by understanding, as God has said, that they are promoting a lie, and God has not sent them. Now, whenever I make a statement like that, and whenever that goes out, the reality is is that we are setting a standard for ourselves in relationship to our beliefs that is far different than a lot of religious organizations out there. You see, our standard is based on what the Word of God says, His Word alone, what it says is the standard by which we are achieving and attempting to achieve our belief system. And it makes it hard because there's a lot of folks that would want us to to take and to to change our approach and to be more accepting. And it's not a matter of, you know what? There isn't anybody that can't walk into this church. But everyone that walks into this church is going to hear the truth of God's Word. And we're not going to change the Word, and we're not going to soften it, and we're not going to tell them, oh, it's okay. And that's exactly what's happening here, is he's saying, Don't listen to these guys that are telling you that there's no consequence for your sin. That there's no consequence for your behavior. Don't listen to these guys that are telling you, oh, it's okay to live this lifestyle or that lifestyle. Oh, it might have said that in the Bible at one point in time, but that was the Old Testament. And it doesn't say that in the New Testament. Well, actually it does, but they just don't read those parts. So he says, stay away from them. I haven't sent them. But the false prophets were challenging Jeremiah by delivering a narrative of their own making. They said, Babylon, Babylon, I'm babbling up here, won't continue to keep Judah in bondage, nor are they going to do any more harm. They said all that had been taken would be soon brought back. In verse 18 it says, But if they are prophets, and if the word of the Lord is with them, Let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts, that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah and Jerusalem, do not go to Babylon. Now, Jeremiah is is providing a prophet test. And what he says is, he says, okay, if these guys are really from the Lord, let them go ahead and pray and make intercession and let them ask the Lord that the rest of the items that are still here. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar first came into Jerusalem, he went into the temple and he took the easy-to-grab stuff. He took all of their utensils and he took all of the items of worship and he took the gold and he took the, the chalices and he took the cups and he took the, the incense, the, 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 the tools of worship that were all of these refined and highly valued things. But there's some stuff that he left behind mostly the stuff that was really big and hard to carry, all right? The big brass 
labor that was out in the, in the, the middle of the, the, the courtyard where they used to wash. And it was this great big, huge, think of a great big, you know, three, 400 gallon vat that stored water for washing. And that. he left that behind. It was just a little too big for him to carry. Same thing with some of the other stuff that was all ornate, the pillars that, that, that were wrapped in gold and things like that. He, he just left some of that stuff there because, again, the first time he came, he thought that he had subdued them, and he now basically had free reign. Well, the second time he goes back, well, he's going to make it a little bit tougher, but the third time, he's going to take it all, and he's not going to leave anything. And Jeremiah says, okay, here's the thing. You go to the Lord and you ask him to leave the stuff that's here and to bring back the other stuff but it's not going to happen. Jeremiah puts the challenge out for these false prophets. If you're speaking for God, then pray that this stuff will not be taken. But this is what the Lord says. Look at verse 19. For thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the pillars, concerning the sea, concerning the carts, concerning the remainder of the vessels that remain in the city, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, did not take when he carried away the captive of Jeconiah and and Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from Jerusalem to Babylon, along with all the nobles of Judah and Jerusalem. Yes, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning the vessels that remain in the house of the Lord and in the house of the king of Judah and of Jerusalem. Listen, verse 22. They shall be carried to Babylon, and there they shall be until the day that I visit them, says the Lord. Then I will bring them up and restore them to this place. So Jeremiah says, okay, guys, ask the Lord for this not to happen, but it's going to happen. This is what's going to take place. He's going to allow Nebuchadnezzar to take everything to Babylon, and it's only going to come back when he says so. When God says it's time, then they're going to come back. Not a moment sooner not a moment later. Now, it's important that we see this here because in a minute, when we roll over down into the next chapter, we're going to see that there were some dates and time frames. Don't you love it when prophets of God give specific timelines for things? All of those dates when things are going to happen that have yet not happened and the time has passed? God's going to get His way. And the sooner that we accept that, the sooner we're going to walk in peace rather than turmoil. Now, it is very hard to watch what's going on in the world. Turmoil, the loss of reason and sense on every front. There is no such thing as common sense anymore. We don't have enough things in common to have common sense. And what's more obvious and even more difficult is that the move is not just towards being unruly. The move is not just towards nonsensical. It's evil. And it's evil in the hearts and the minds of men, and even more so in the hearts and minds of the leaders of this country. There's great fear, there's confusion, as no one has any real answers, and they're not willing to turn to the one that does. But this is where we have such a great advantage. I'm going to tell you this right now. If you're sitting here today and you're worried or you're afraid about how things are going, stop. Stop worrying. Stop being afraid. Oh, we're in a battle. We're in a battle. There's no doubt about it. And there's there's going to continue to be a battle for the hearts and the minds and the souls of this nation. But the reality is, is that we know the one that has already prescribed and given us the battle plan. But there's great fear and there's confusion. And because of that, the people of God like now, like maybe never any other time in our lifetimes, need to take and stand on the promises and the plan that he's laid before us. God's got a plan where man's plan fails. Worldwide pandemic. Man's plan. Run. Hide. Don't come out. God says, don't fear, I'm with you always. Economic downturn. Man says, we need more government money. More stimulus. God says, lay up treasure in heaven where moths and rust don't enter in. 
protests in the street due to inequality. Man says, riot, burn, disband the belief, the beliefs. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I gotta leave it alone. I gotta leave it alone. It speaks for itself. God says, my son died for whosoever. All men are equal in my eyes. Total lack of unity amongst our leadership is the battle over control rages on between the various sides. God says the government will rest on his shoulders and all will be made righteous upon the coming of the king. And whenever I get too overcome by what's going on around me and, 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 and I start looking at the world, I have to be reminded just how much I need the Lord and I need his people and I need fellowship. How much I need church and the ability to come together so that we can see within the hearts and minds of the believers in God the strength that God pours out upon us. We need to come together for worship. We need to come together to praise Him. We need to come together in His comfort so that we can comfort each other. We need to be laying hands upon those that are sick and we need to be anointing with oil and we need to be encouraging each other and we need to be having the fellowship that is prescribed by God because it is the very thing that will help us to sustain and be used of God in these times that we find ourselves walking in right now. We've been given our marching orders. We're told to go and make what? Disciples. Disciples. But even more so, we've been given God's word <clears throat> that the war is already won. We need to stay engaged in the battle. Moving on to chapter 28. And it happened the same year at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. In the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet who was from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priests and all the people. He said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord of the house, or the Lord's house, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. And I will bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah who went to Babylon, says the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So Jeremiah now identifies by name probably his greatest opposer, this other prophet now being identified, obviously, as a false prophet by the name of Hananiah. And he goes, hey, it's all right. Within two years, this is all going to blow over. Within two years, everything's coming back. Don't sweat it. It's not going to be a problem. But it's a false narrative. What we've come to know, again, as fake news. And it was running rapid in their time, and it's running rapid in our time. And there's so much bad information that it's nearly impossible to find the truth. It's nearly impossible for us to, in any way, shape, or form, sort through and find that which is true from any other source than God's Word. And so we need to say, so, so. Tight and involved in God's word, that there's no room for this false narrative to get in. You know, and it's interesting because we were told, Daniel prophesied, talking about the end times and talking about the fact that men would run to and fro, that there would just be all of this hyperactivity, everybody going everywhere, everybody doing everything without really any purpose or any meaning. But then he also says that information, that knowledge would increase greatly. It doesn't say wisdom would increase greatly. How many of you have noticed that there is way too much knowledge out there available today? Now, when we talk about knowledge, we're not talking about accuracy. We're not talking about truth. We're not talking about wisdom. We're just talking about access to information. All right? And at the time that Daniel was told us, what the Lord told him to do is he said, 
but this is too much for you to handle right now, Daniel. You shut that up in the book, and it won't be open until the time that the, that the end comes. But in that time, one of the signs that are going to happen or the signs of the time are going to be people are going to be running all over the place with no purpose and no direction. Did you watch the news yesterday? And knowledge will increase exponentially. Got these devices and these 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 wonderful aspects and guys there are some great I, I i use the internet more than i should probably but man you can find stuff on it can't you i mean you buy something and, and you don't have the manual for it it's on the internet who took the time to put that people there's a lot of people with way too much time on their hands And if you can find useful information, then there's people that have way too much time on their hands posting all that non-useful information up there. But the fact of the matter is, is that we've confronted and we've found ourselves in this place to where there's all of this information that's going on. The mob rules, the ungodly, have overtaken the narrative. And when you add to this the amount of false information that we have playing out before our eyes and you add to that those that are willing to believe the false information the only hope that we do have is to speak god's word and not diminish a bit of it and you know what we're going to take heat for it we're going to take heat for it we're going to we're going to suffer loss from time to time because and and you know it's it's to be expected because that's exactly what jesus told us was going to happen wasn't it He didn't say, hey, if you speak the truth, you're going to be protected and everyone's going to listen and your life is going to be great and you're going to be an icon in your time. Just like I was. No. These men are going to hate you. Your family's going to hate you. They're going to revile you. They're going to say all kinds of evil things about you. They're going to seek to put you to death and at times they will put you to death. But we're to continue to speak the truth of God's word with boldness. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah, in the presence of the priest and in the presence of all the people who stood in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen! The Lord do so. The Lord perform your words which you have prophesied and bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all who were carried away captive from Babylon to this place. I love the fact that Jeremiah shows great restraint and incredible diplomacy. What he says is he goes, Wow! I hope what you're saying comes true. May it be. Amen means so be it. You guys know that, right? To say amen means so be it. So be it. Oh, man, from your lips to God's ears. Should it be? Could it be? Oh, I hope that it's going to all be over in two years. Oh, I hope that this is all going to change. This is a wonderful plan. This is is amazing. Look at what it says in verse 7. Nevertheless, Hear now the word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all people. The prophets who have been before me and before you of old prophesied against many countries and great kingdoms of war and disaster and pestilence. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Again, here's the prophet test. Jeremiah sets up the prophet test. He says, all right, time will tell. Nevertheless, I hope that what you're saying comes true, but we'll know in two years and a day, won't we? I mean, you've set a timeline. You've said that this is going to... Jeremiah already knows that the Lord has said that the captivity and the bondage is going to go on for 70 years. I love the fact that he doesn't get in a hurry to try to shut this guy down. Well, let me tell you what's really going to happen. He just goes, wait for it. There's some wisdom there. I mean, as believers, sometimes we have to be willing to let something just kind of play out. There's got to be times that we've got to allow the Lord to work. And there's other times when we've got to act immediately, but there's other times it's like, hey, okay, knock yourself out. Continue down the path that you're on for a while. Let's see how that works out for you. And Jeremiah says, all right, let's see what happens. And in time, we will see who it is that the Lord has truly sent. Then Hananiah took the prop... Prop, or Hananiah the prophet took the yoke off of the prophet Jeremiah's neck and broke it. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people, Thus says the Lord, Even so I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, 
from the neck of all the nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Jeremiah didn't mount a great big strong defense because he didn't have to. He knew what God was going to do. And so because of that, Hananiah ramps up his attack. In an act of showmanship, he takes the yoke off of Jeremiah's neck and he breaks it. And it's kind of like taking a speech and ripping it on camera. When confronted with the truth, <laughs> it, it was just there. When, when confronted with the truth, those who are spreading a false narrative will always resort to confrontation. Remember when it used to be thought that, that those that were, that were on the the liberal-minded side of things were the ones that were for everybody and for everything and you had to have an open mind. You realize that they're the most closed-minded people that are out there. You can believe anything you want as long as it's what they believe. If you believe anything opposed it, you don't have any free. There's no freedom and there's no liberty within that process. It's all about them bringing into alignment with their thought processes and their beliefs by force if necessary. And that's what we see happening right now. A lie cannot stand on its own merit. It must try to take down the truth. And that's why we see so much violence associated with the cultural unrest that we have in our country today. The false narrative is pushing its way on the people. And whenever it encounters truth, it has to turn to force or violence in order to continue on its path because it cannot do so by standing on merit. What's frightening is that we see so many who are willing because they have nothing else on which to stand giving in to the false narrative. And they do so without, many of them, without any opposition at all. The fear of man gives power to the lie. And when there is no truth, the lie gains great strength. In verse 12, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from his neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord. Now I want you to notice that before it was happening in front of the court. It was happening in front of of, of the priest that was happening in front of the people. And now the Lord says, I want you to go to Hananiah personally. I want you to go, just you, just go talk to him. And say, so you have broken the yoke of wood, but you have made in their place yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of these nations that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. I have given him the beasts of the fields also. So God says, go and tell Hananiah. And the Lord gives Jeremiah a message that is just for him. And he says, here's the thing. Your little stunt of breaking the yoke and making this public spectacle, you might have thought that you impressed those that were watching, but you didn't impress me. I'm not impressed. And what you've done now is that you've sealed it to the point to where you think that you can break a yoke of wood and somehow create this symbolic action that's going to change the way things are but instead it has been replaced now with a yoke of iron and it will not be broken and it will not be changed and then the message gets real personal then the prophet jeremiah said to hananiah the prophet here now hananiah the lord has not sent you but you make the people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I cast you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah, the prophet, died the same year in the seventh month. Through Jeremiah, God tells Hananiah, it's over. I'm going to take your life because you've deceived my people. And guys, while we live in these very troubling times, I believe that we too are facing the potential of great bondage when it comes to our nation. I believe that everything that we're seeing is pointing towards this aspect of the loss of liberties and the loss of freedoms and the loss of the ability to, to do that which we have cherished so long and for, for, for taken for granted so much so in this country. 
And I believe that it's going to cause us to have to reevaluate. We're going to have to look closely and make sure that we're not buying into the false narrative and the fake news that's increasing each and every day in the airways. We're going to have to pour in and push in even more so on the Word of God, knowing that there is but still one solution. There's only one solution. And he's got a name. And that name is Jesus, who is just, who is righteous, who is loving, who is merciful, and he's Savior. That's the message that needs to go out. There is hope. There is a means by which we can see change happen in this country. But you know the biggest change that I'm interested in? Rather, we see this nation turn back to being a godly nation or we see it come to its utter end. The change that I want to see is the change in the heart of man that moves them away from evil and into the light and moves them to the place of receiving and accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And the only way they will do that is by hearing the Word of God. Amen?